and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to TPA Global's webinar on your tax technology plan. I am Avisha Sooth. I'm an associate with TPA Global. And with me is my colleague, Maria Grigorieva. She's also an associate with TPA Global. We will be your speakers for today. Today, in the next hour, we will cover, start with how have the CFO's expectations changed in the post peps world? What does staying out of trouble and being fully in control mean? And what should be a CFO's journey from one to the other? We will cover um, a survey that we conducted during a physical event that we had conducted in Amsterdam on tax technology, and we'll share with you responses of the participants from that event. Further to that, we will introduce you to the best practices, what you should keep in mind when choosing a software, and what should be the steps included in your tax technology plan. We will structure the presentation in a way that we will use the first 40 to 45 minutes to describe all the things we just mentioned. And thereafter, the floor will be open to everyone for questions. In the meantime, you will have a chat box in front of you where you can post your questions, but we will address all questions at the very end. Right. So if we move on to the next slide. So what has changed now in the post peps world? In the, in the pre webs world, the picture that you see on the left-hand side reflects tax and TP function to be a profit center, whereas on the right-hand side, it, so it suggests, possibly suggests, it's a cost center now. Well, why is that? It's because tax planning was such an aggressive exercise, has been for many decades for multinationals, that has helped them reduce not just the profit uh, on which they pay tax in each and every country, and has pro also provided them multiple opportunities to optimize their ETR by uh, deciding which locations, which locations to locate their profits to, and their, therefore, which locations to pay what tax on. And most often, it has been governed by which are the low tax jurisdictions, and therefore, a lot of companies have been able to sometimes artificially shift profit to locations which offer a favorable tax rate. However, in the post webs world, it does not, there are a lot of countries that are coming forward following the OECD into putting regulations that not only ask for more and more compliance, but also put a burden on MNEs to disclose a lot more information that has ever been disclosed before. So with this in mind, the tax and TP function within a company has been reduced to a cost center function responsible for compliance and not aggressive tax planning. Well, there's a, you see a question mark there, that is because it is compliance, yes, a cost center function is still debatable because all the companies that have had aggressive tax planning structures need to restructure their structures in a BEPS compliance manner. So the role of tax and TP function within a company is going to be still important, but not from the point of view of optimizing the company's ETR by using tax planning opportunities, but rather optimizing the ETR by using BEPS compliance structures and restructuring the company's model in such a manner. If we move on to the next slide, that discusses what does BEPS demand? Well, the OECD asks for a value chain analysis in the master file. It does not describe what format to use for a value chain analysis. So perhaps you could draw four pie charts that reflect your revenue, gross margin, operating margin, and FTE by geography, and think that it can be sufficient. But before you start documenting your value chain analysis in such a way and making it public, you should keep in mind that your CIT returns in each local country your TP master file and TP local files in each and every country, your indirect tax returns such as custom returns, VAT returns, are also providing a lot of information to tax authorities. And with a lot of exchange of information between tax authorities, it is possible for tax authorities to judge whether a value chain analysis described in your master file and the numbers pertaining to that reported in your C by C reporting 
whether or not these two match with all your local country files as a part of PPE compliance, CIT returns filed in the local countries, or any indirect filings reported by your group entities in any of the countries. So, what's the way to tie it all together? A value chain analysis? Yes, but how to do it? OECD prescribes one approach. China, as an aggressive tax authority, has provided yet another approach and the, one of the most extensive ways of conducting and presenting a value chain analysis. And other countries are following suit. So, in this world, if you do not do a value chain analysis that is aligned with all forms of not just the compliance reporting that you see on the screen, but also from a point of view of strategy and governance, you are at more and more risk of controversy. Now, a way to not just avoid but manage controversy effectively is tax technology, and which is what we will introduce to you in the upcoming slides. Now, how can technology help manage controversy, you might ask? It is that A, it's an increasing compliance burden that comes along with BEPS. It is an unprecedented level of data um, that comes in the hands of tax authorities after BEPS. And, and a lack of, uh, lack of communication between various departments within your own company leads to different, type, different information being reported in all of these items across different jurisdictions. That raises the risk of controversy, but also a software can assist you tremendously in this respect because a software can help you keep track of all compliance deadlines. A software can give you a better grip on your financial data analytics. A software can help you manage your organization and governance rules more clearly so that if you have reported something in your transfer pricing reports, you also have a governance structure backing all of it up. So if questioned by any of the tax authorities, you can project the functional flows in your uh, followed with a very strict governance structure in your company. Uh, another connected uh, slide is the next one, which talks about a CFO's journey for being in control. Now, this is a clear requirement emanating from BEPS because you have to do a value chain analysis. You have to do a country by country report. Now, and you cannot do a lot of tax planning using a lot of low tax countries without having substance there. So now that you're forced almost to do all of these things, why not use this compliance, annual compliance requirement to become, to be better in control of your own company? Now, why another reason why this is important is not just OECD, but there is also a surprising sense of cooperation among a lot of countries in following and implementing the ideas put forward by the OECD. One such example is the International Compliance Assurance Program, where eight countries, UK, US, Netherlands, Australia, Spain, Germany, and Italy, have come together to deploy common resources towards conducting tax risk assessment towards interpreting C by C or other data for m and &E selected as test cases on a voluntary basis. And just last week, with the OECD publishing a tax risk assessment guide on using and interpreting C by C data gives more to, gives more courage to these countries and tools to others who are not part of this program to start you start interpreting your C by C data into determining whether your profit per FTE, for example, matches with your peer group or not, and various other such data, such ratio analysis, such as whether your operating margin matches with the significant people functions responsible for generating that operating margin. So therefore, we have put together six steps that not only allow you to be most compliant in this post-PEPS world, but also bring you towards having a better control of your company. So now let's see. The first step towards 
having full control is an active control on your data. That comes only from a clear understanding of what data is available at a global level and how to report it in a manner harmonized with your operational conduct. That is, there should be no mismatches between reported people and reported profits. Uh, an example to keep in mind here is, it was not so long ago in the case of Caterpillar Incorporation, a US multinational giant in the construction equipment industry that shifted 85% of its income from US to Switzerland without shifting the significant people functions responsible for generation of that income. This could have been easily assessed and managed at a preliminary stage if the company would have conducted ratio analysis and had had a better grip on its financial data, which can be made, which can be facilitated very easily by using a software. The next step in the journey towards being fully in control is being able to document the data that you have collected in the first step in a BEPS compliant manner. A value chain analysis is a part of mandatory compliance anyway. Why not use it to develop a global tax compliance approach where master file, local file, tax returns, VAT returns, everything tells the same story, thereby preventing your chances of getting into a dispute. At this stage, a software can be extremely helpful in tracking deadlines and in also removing the subjectivity involved by using different people either within your company or different tax advisors across the globe to prepare who prepare these reports for you. Moving on to step three, which talks about risk planning and provisioning and ETR impact. Well, after collecting all this data, putting it in your compliance documents, it's only logical you may want to try using it for ETR optimization purposes or for improving the quality of your earnings. An example here to keep in mind is of Procter & Gamble, which after conducting detailed value chain analysis and providing extensive information to different to tax authorities, leading to 17 multilateral, uh, bilateral and unilateral APAs were able to reduce their tax provision, provisioning by one fourth, thereby improving their quality of earnings significantly. The next step, uh, which I was alluding to a little bit earlier, is aligning your governance and operational conduct. Well, I'll, this is an extremely important step, especially in the post preps world, this step allows you to make sure all the departments within your organization are communicating effectively to each other. It also allows you to ensure that if you put a tax structure in your books, whether or not you have a governance mechanism supporting such a tax structure. Um, in case, this step is also important because in case, BEPS is not putting into question all tax planning structures. It is only putting into question those tax planning structures which lack substance behind, behind them. Now, this having a clear governance structure can help you build that substance that may or may not be lacking behind your tax structure. So if you put certain amount of income based on a certain functionality in a certain jurisdiction, if you have a clear governance structure supporting the decision maker, the location of the decision makers in respect of that function, it will tremendously exp uh, exp increase your chances of proving your story in front of the tax authorities. Well, the following, uh, the next steps five and six are to prevent yourself, to make sure you prevent yourself from threats. Threats from both internal and external. Step five covers internal challenges that you should deal with effectively. And the next one explains the external challenges that you should deal with. Well, internal challenges could be miscommunication between different uh, departments. For example, there is not a clear succession planning taken into account by your HR department. There is not a 
clear IT system in place that facilitates easy extraction of financial data from all entities and allows for reporting it in a harmonized manner. These kind of uh, in another point in managing in internal in-house challenges is also ensuring transparency in your conduct. This will ensure faith in the employee of the employees in your organization in your organization. This is important because after a disciplinary hearing of Caterpillar Inc., which we just discussed a minute ago, investors of Caterpillar Inc. filed a, filed a case against the Caterpillar for defrauding them for not having made their tax structure publicly available to the investors. So if you are, so it's not just external sources that you get threats from, it's also internal, such as your investors, who may not have faith in your operations and maybe may want to file a case against you. And last step in this journey of being fully in control is to cover yourself for, from threat from external sources, such as Panama Papers, Lux Leaks, or any other such data leakage. Uh, because even if you are on your way to becoming fully in control, but you haven't collected your data and haven't uh, yet made, a, haven't yet built up a strong storyline to support the allocation of profits or income in your data to various jurisdictions, external threats such as Panama Papers or LuxLeaks can also put your financial, unprepared financials available to public at large, which also includes tax authorities in various countries where you may have operations, thereby again increasing your chances for being for putting yourself at disputes. This concludes our presentation on CFO's journey from staying out of trouble to being in control. Now we move on to the next uh, slide, which discusses a little bit of what we saw from the participants of our tax technology event that was conducted in Amsterdam on 7th of September 2017. <clears throat> Here, we talked to uh, participants about which were corporate, which were CFOs, heads of taxes from about 30 to 40 organizations. And uh, we put, to, put forward to them two broad questions. A, do you have a tax technology plan for FY2017? And where are you on your tax journey? And by the second one, we mean in keeping in mind the six steps we just outlined, where do you see yourself? Do you still have a staying out of trouble attitude that you want to just be merely compliant in the, jurist, in the way that you have been pre -beps? Or do you really know what happens where in your company and what gets reported where as well? Well, the answers to both of these questions were not very surprising, which is why we felt the need for a tax technology event as well as this webinar. Not having a tax technology plan, which was reported by about 75% of the audience, is not a very good sign because if you not only technology helps you get a stronger control on your financials, but it also helps you with just local reporting, as we discussed also previously, and as my colleague Maria will explain to you in a minute what your tax technology plan would mean and what benefits it brings. Uh, we will open the floor to discussion in, at the end of the webinar where we would like to ask you similar questions as well, as in, do you have a tax technology plan and where do you see yourself on the tax journey for your company? And with that, we move on to a presentation of what should be the best practices for your tax technology plan. And here, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Maria, who will explain it to you further. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to further uh, highlight for you other questions that we ask to our corporate audience. Uh, and the common answers that we got is, uh, if you would like to implement the software, what uh, key challenges it should address, what uh, features it should have, and what benefits do you expect from the software. And you see the answers on your screen now, and I think if you ask these questions to yourself, 
uh, you will also get a similar answers because I think uh, currently with a lot of uh, data required by tax authorities, uh, it is the main challenge uh, to find this data and uh, to have it in the right format and uh, to have it correctly without any errors or omissions. So with this, we move to the best practices. And if you ever have seen the software demo of any kind of tax technology solution, I think you recognize this picture uh, that uh, what they promise is that you uh, dump in all the data you have, be it ERP data, legal agreements, PDFs, Excel, or any kind of other format that you might have, and uh, you get out from this magical solution everything that you need on compliance and analytics. Well, uh, it is possible, but it is not 100% true because depending on type of organization you have, depending on how you allocate responsibilities internally, depending actually on which data you have and how clean it is, then it would uh, um, actually uh, decide for you which technology solution you should apply. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, uh, we move to our tax technology plan, uh, which you need to first draft for yourself before actually look into any kind of demos and uh, buying any kind of software packages. So your tax technology plan should have uh, these six components. So the first one as any kind of plan of any type, it should have objectives. The second one is output reverse engineering, which I will explain later. Uh, the third one is organization and governance, which means uh, the allocation of responsibilities within your tax, TP, or any kind of other department. Uh, then you should select the workflow, which you automate, and it can be uh, TP compliance in general, or it can be more specific, let's say it's only C by C reporting. Uh, once you've gone through those four steps, you can then look into actual, uh, actual functionality of the software and run the RFP and vendor selection. And the last step is project implementation, which of course most of you have uh, an extensive experience in, but it's a good point that it should be in writing and you should have it really clear. So I will bring you uh, ingredient by ingredient. And in the end, we will just conclude uh, on the plan. So the first one, uh, when you start drafting your tax technology plan, you should ask yourself, which area of tax is your company's main concern? Uh, is it TP documentation, which uh, lots of uh, companies are looking into now? Or maybe it doesn't take that much time and it's not that difficult. And maybe your main concern is wages tax because you are the company who outsources lots of employees. Or maybe you are importing and exporting lots of goods and then actually customs and trade is your main issue. So this, this question is really specific organization by organization. And uh, once you have an answer to it, and these are possible answers, but maybe may something else. Uh, for example, with uh, asking this question, we also realize that uh, this holding tax uh, can be also a huge issue for a company. So uh, it will really depend uh, on your specific situation. Once this question is answered, you can then move to ingredient two, which is output reverse engineering. Uh, here you see the normal process of any kind of uh, preparation of compliance or analytics uh, uh, analytics, uh, and you actually get the source data, which are just your financial or any kind of entries. You then import it into your ERP or uh, any kind of other system. Then you map it in the tax data warehouse, which can be uh, software, and then you get your output. And the output can be in the form of uh, TP reports, uh, different kind of tax returns, or uh, just uh, outlier analytics. Uh, but uh, in order to get the process right, you need to start from the very end. So uh, if from the, your objectives you selected that TP documentation uh, is your main concern, then your output would be, for example, master file. So you know your output, and then you need to go back uh, one step and see 
uh, actually what uh, information do you need from master file and how it should be mapped. So you have the section of the master file and this is your mapping. You go one step back and you look at uh, how the data is imported. So you want to get it in the right format. For example, you need uh, your consolidated financials. And uh, if you, you see it at the import stage that uh, you are lacking this, then you need to go one step back and see uh, the source data. So actually where these financials entered, because uh, we've seen the situation uh, in the software implementation that the company knew the output, they knew how they should map the data. Uh, they even had the right ERP system with the right uh, ledgers to do it, but uh, at the very point of source data, so at the point of entries, they, there were just no entries available because uh, the person who was, was supposed to enter the data just did not enter, let's say, the marketing expenses uh, into several codes, but rather just into one code, and then the uh, reduction was not possible because there was no differentiation between the entries. So this is very, very important step uh, because from this step, lots of uh, implementation projects can fail uh, that, the, that because of the source data is not available. Uh, other example can be uh, at the step of data import where you thought you know how to map the data, but this kind of mapping is not uh, linked to your system. So for example, uh, you need the sophisticated calculations for your outlier analytics, but uh, you have the data only in a spreadsheet where this kind of uh, cross uh, sections, ratios, and calculations are just not possible or are too burdensome. So uh, with this, we move to the third step uh, about organization and governance. Uh, and we think that uh, there are at least three uh, organizational models that we commonly see in the tax departments. And of course, as I mentioned before, this uh, can be specific to your company, uh, or you can have a mix of uh, one of those three, but uh, at least there's uh, three typical uh, models. And the first one is when uh, there is a global uh, central team that is performing most of the uh, jobs. Uh, so, for example, preparation of reports and returns. And uh, it, got, uh, it gets support from the uh, local entities in the form of just uh, provision of information uh, or any kind of consulting. The second model uh, is where uh, the local entities are in the lead. So they do prepare, for example, local files. And the central team is only providing the standard templates and is performing QC work. The third model is uh, similar to the second one with the difference that uh, the uh, preparation happens uh, in the shared service center. Uh, supported by the local entities and QC by the central team. And the last model is, type, is really typical for the big corporations where they uh, outsource uh, this kind of uh, routine uh, preparations to the shared service center in a local location. Uh, once you define your uh, type of model, you can also look one uh, layer deeper and actually see who is responsible for what. Uh, this can be done with the use of RACI concept, where R is responsible, A is accountable, so the person who is uh, really have the ultimate responsibility uh, for the sort of workflow. Uh, C is consultant, and I is informed. So this example uh, provides uh, allocation of responsibilities within the TP department. Uh, and we, if we look at, for example, maintenance of TP documentation, we see that deputy TP and TP operational are responsible for actual preparation of reports, while lead TP person uh, is uh, accountable and signs off on this kind of reports, only consulting with the local team and informing the head of tax that reports are prepared. And this example is closer to the first model, 
where the central team is uh, preparing everything and is only consulting and uh, supplying some information from the local team. Again, uh, I would like to highlight that this is specific for your organization and this is just an example of how it can be allocated. And the importance of getting this picture clear is that uh, once you know who is performing what and who is responsible for what, it is easier than to uh, implement software because within the software you would need also to do this kind of allocation for the users and uh, provision of certain rights and permissions within the software. Uh, th this slide covers uh, also organization. So once you've done this as is, uh, mapping and uh, when you know what type of organization you have, you have uh, who is responsible for what, you can then uh, start the change management process, which is uh, of course required if you implement uh, software. And uh, ideally, this change management should lead to standardization and harmonization. And it's important to mention that this uh, standardization and harmonization can be achieved even before the software is implemented, just when you uh, allocate all the workflows and responsibilities in the right way. Uh, so uh, uh, then uh, having uh, your organization right. Uh, with this in mind, you can then actually move to uh, use of technology, uh, where you need to think of also cost efficiency uh, and time efficiency of such implementation because you did achieve for sure some efficiencies just at the step of uh, harmonization. Uh, you may also think of some outsourcing or core sourcing of certain activities, uh, which uh, is uh, just maybe uh, more cost efficient to do outside the organization. Uh, based on this, you can build the business case that uh, you can present to your CFO if you are head of tax or to your CEO. Uh, to in order to prove that the software is indeed something that is required. So step four uh, covers uh, the uh, selection of the workflows that you need to automate, and this was partly covered uh, when you thought of the objective of your plan, but is more specific. So within, for example, uh, TP documentation uh, objective, you may think of only one workflow. For example, C by C, which you think is really simple and repetitive year by year, so you can automate it. Uh, other example can be uh, within the VAT returns. Uh, so uh, VAT return is something simple for your organization and is easy to prepare, while uh, the complex workflow is when it comes to uh, the actual uh, tax audits or uh, certain uh, controversy with the tax authorities. So this is something that for now cannot be resolved through the software. Uh, so thinking of this workflows, you will then uh, understand the and select the workflows that are simple and repetitive and routine and that can be automated. With this in mind, you can finally move to the selection of your software and based on the information you gathered and knowing uh, what kind of output you want, uh, what is your organization doing day by day, and which workflow is uh, repetitive and can be done by the software, you can think of certain list of uh, functionality. So, for example, you want to have report writing, you want to have audit trails, you want to have workflow management, or uh, you want to have uh, automated generation of returns. So, this list you need to prepare and uh, with this kind of list, you can then run the vendor selection process because it would be much easier knowing what uh, exactly you need. Just put the ticks against the functionality you thought you need and understand which vendor uh, is appropriate for you. Then, once the vendor is selected, uh, oh, sorry, uh, these are also these are the questions that. Uh, can help yourself uh, to also select the functionality. So uh, answering these questions, uh, for example, how do you currently manage your compliance and analytics? 
uh, if you think of it and answer that you currently manage your compliance uh, in grid files and your analytics in Excel, then you uh, may think that you want this to be performed by the software. So, for example, automate the calculation. Uh, or if your team, uh, answering the fourth question, that your team spends uh, quite some time uh, on the preparation of reports while they are all the same each and every year, uh, then you may think that you want to automate report writing. Uh, you also may think that uh, it's just some generic functionality. So, uh, for example, you want uh, a calendar or certain alerts to be sent to your team members. Or you want to have the traffic light uh, dashboard where you see that uh, some things are done and some are not, and what is the deadline. Uh, this is really specific, and I'm just giving you examples, and uh, different kinds of software packages can do different things. And, uh, for example, uh, TPA has available around uh, 12 different software packages, and the reason is exactly because we know that uh, it, each company has different requirements, and for some companies it's only they want to have uh, TP reports writing, while others really want uh, the ERP on tax, so really looking into tax provisioning and tax accounting. Uh, and we uh, that's why we started with the tax technology plan, so uh, asking these questions to uh, the client that is looking for automation to help them to understand their uh, true needs and not just showing them demos, uh, which they say, okay, I like it or I don't like it and then uh, realizing that it actually doesn't fit to the organization because the team is too small or that they don't have the source data to use such uh, complicated systems. The last step uh, is uh, the project implementation. And uh, as I mentioned, of course, uh, this is just a simple project management thing, but uh, it's important to cover those two points. So the first one uh, is uh, which elements are fundamental to achieve the project goals. So uh, in my opinion, these are the harmonization, uh, this is standardization, and this is the uh, clear vision of the objective. And the project approach is how to execute uh, your plan, so the plan that you drafted and created. Uh, uh, it's important to uh, have the uh, certain schedule for the meetings. It's important to have the uh, ways of uh, certain resolutions of any uh, challenges that you might have. Uh, and it's important to track the, uh, the implementation steps and the certain milestones that you achieve. Uh, then it would help you to implement the software in a quicker and efficient way and, of course, to use it for your purposes. So, uh, this is, the, again, the uh, summary of the tax technology plan. So, now it's an index uh, that you can use for your preparation. Uh, and I would like just to summarize. So, the first one is uh, objective. So, define your end game. Define what is your concern. The second one is output reverse engineering. So from that end game, you need to go all the way back to source data that you would uh, need for such output. The third one is organization and governance. So understand what your team is doing, uh, who is doing what, who is responsible for what, and how you organize yourself to prepare such output. The first one is uh, among the uh, responsibilities and workflows that you perform, you can select that one or several ones that are the most simple and repetitive and that can be automated. Uh, and based on those four steps, you can then think of functionality that you need. Uh, actually answering is a soft, can software perform uh, the C by C report for you because you think it's uh, rather simple or that it can help you to manage your organization uh, with a uh, dashboard. And when the, you've done the vendor selection and you actually decided which software you want to use, you need to run the project implementation. 
uh, having in mind that you still need to have a clear plan, uh, the steps and the milestones uh, that would help you to track the project progress and the achievements. Uh, I would like you uh, now to uh, ask your questions, please. You can type them in a text box. Uh, I would also like, uh, if you can, uh, to uh, type uh, what is uh, your uh, view on tax technology plan. So do you have a tax technology plan or are you planning to create one? Uh, or uh, if you already have something in mind, then just, just please elaborate your answer. And the second question was, uh, where are you on your tax journey? Uh, and uh, this means, do you think you are fully in control of all your tax agenda, or do you think that you are on the way to this, or you still uh, think that staying out of trouble, so just uh, avoiding disputes is sufficient enough to survive in today's BAPS world. I would like to thank you for attending our today's webinar. Uh, and if you still have any questions, you can uh, ask them uh, by email or just please feel free to give us a call. And thank you. And uh, see you next time in our webinars.